Well, Orlando, we've, we've heard so much about the wonderful things that AI is going to do for our lives, to improve our lives. I'm sure a lot of that is true. But I think it's useful also to think about there are some risks, including particularly security risks that AI introduces to the world. And who better to talk about this than Orlando Bravo, who has acquired over 250 billion worth of software companies. This is the largest tech private equity firm fund in the world, manages over $170 billion under management. If you put together all, as I understand it, if you put together all the security companies that you've acquired, you'd, be, you'd have the largest cybersecurity firm in the world. Can you believe it? We, we actually do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been talking, we've known that there were cybersecurity issues for decades now. And, and tell us a little bit about your experience. Before we get to AI, just to set the stage in the background, tell us a little bit about your experience with cybersecurity. Well, John, first, thank you for interviewing me. I want to stay on your good side. You, you run, definitely are. You, you run the largest litigation and best litigation firm in the world, so I want to stay as your friend. We're friends. Um, and, you feel to you're totally safe here. And, and, and we want to thank the hosts of, of this conference. It's just been incredible, and I'm really happy as a relatively new Miami resident that, that you're all doing it here. So, so we appreciate that. Look, I, I can see in the crowd there's some experienced investors and also some younger investors. Cyber has also always been a really, really tricky place for private equity because it's very expensive to get into. It's very fragmented. So the way we got into it, we were lucky. In 2008, there was a financial crisis, and we were able to buy a cyber company called Entrust for two bucks a share, an identity company. We got very lucky on that deal. We made seven times. We bought another company for 550 million called SonicWall. We made 4X in 18 months. So we said, let's do more. We bought, we bought Bluco for 1.1 billion. We made money. So we built our business and our cyber business one deal at a time, which is an old school way of doing it. But there came a point about five years after we started that we had so much cyber in our portfolio that I remember asking Carl Toma, who is the goat of investing since 1980. He started private equity. I asked him, do you think we have too much cyber in our portfolio? And he's not a tech investor, he's a generalist. He said, you, you, you could never have too much cybersecurity investments. And boy, was he right. It's been kind of our, one of our best fields. Well, let's talk now, let's turn to AI. And how has AI made cybersecurity different? What particular issues does AI present for cybersecurity, the cybersecurity world and the security world generally? You, you're part of at the forefront about writing about this and, and analyzing it from a legal perspective. And the one liner I would give everybody is AI just makes the bad guys worse from a cyber standpoint. You take a very rudimentary use case. You take email. Email is your number one threat vector for cyber, right? You, get all this training, people click on the wrong email, and somebody infiltrates your network. We own, our fund owns a company called Proofpoint. They're a $2 billion company. They're the number one cybersecurity uh, vendor in the world. And what they have seen since Gen AI has taken off is the number of email cyber attacks has increased 4x from what it was before. We received about a trillion emails a year on our servers, and then we determined based on an AI algorithm that the company has, whether that email should go to the customer, whether it's safe, or whether we hold it. And that's Without ever even opening the email. Without ever opening the email, because a lot of cyber companies are AI companies. That's, it's very important that people understand that that's the way they were started, because cyber threats became so complicated that you needed machine learning in order to be able to deal with them. But on the flip side of that, to make everybody happy, is you have companies like Proofpoint that have exceptional technology. So then they use Gen AI themselves. And in the case of Proofpoint, we stripped Google's LLM. We trained it on about 10 trillion emails that we had received over 10 years. So we have access to the data for training the model. And now Proofpoint can tell the customer not only whether the email is safe or not, it can tell the customer the intent of the sender of the email. A lot richer functionality, a lot more important and that's what customers um, really appreciate and pay for in terms of a cyber, cyber vendor. So it's, can AI actually help identify attacks, responses, vulnerabilities, and help make sure there are timely responses to attacks? In all kinds of ways. And, and look, 
beyond responding to an attack is kind of setting your company up in the first place to be safe. If you ask any strategic the largest strategic buyers of technology companies, including cyber companies themselves, what is your number one priority in cybersecurity? What would you like to buy? They would say identity, uh, identity management. And we're lucky that our team has two of the most important identity companies. SailPoint, which went public last week. It's about a $15 billion market cap company. And Ping Identity. Now, what you do in identity is, remember, you have to, it, it's, it's, it's a concept that they call it zero trust. You can now trust nothing and no one, no machine, no agent, no individual. Look at all of us, you know, you walk into your office, everybody knows you're the CEO, you still have to identify yourself multiple times. So when you look at identity, think about all the applications that you have in your company. Think about some of you have 50,000 employees in your company. You have all this data in your company. How do you know that a given employee should be looking at a given application and a given data? Do you want certain people to be looking at employee information and employee compensation and bonuses? Yeah, if they're in the HR department and they have the, the governance to do it, but not in other areas. So there's this whole field that matches up the individual identity with the machine identity with the data or the application that they're supposed to grab. With AI, this is a lot more complicated because I think we heard panelists before talking about agents and agentic use cases in AI. So if you have to identify all these individuals, imagine a world where you have to identify multiples of that in terms of agents. Yeah. I mean, you told me when we were talking earlier that AI can permit almost anybody to appear as anybody else, that the, it creates such convincing cases and information and contact that it can fool people and fool machines. That's what happened in the case of Proofpoint, right? When you look at email and email attacks, Somebody can write an email pretending that they're your bank, the bank that you always work with, the bank that you use, that they know you personally. But now with Gen AI, they can make that almost to perfection. I mean, they can look like your favorite Bank of America in a transaction you're about to do, and that's really risky. That's why you need these great cyber vendors to counteract that. And once again, the attacks are now more frequent. They're, they're using complicated AI um, algorithms as well to attack their nation state attacks. They're well-funded people that commit fraud, that look at transactions, that do all kinds of things. But at the other side, you have an industry that's really good as well. You just need to invest in it and stay ahead of it. Regulation of AI is a hot topic. In recent years, it's been controversial. Should it be regulated? Are we having too much regulation? Is it going to hold back innovation? The pendulum now seems to be swinging, especially under President Trump, uh, it's kind of against or rolling back regulation. Is there a role for regulation or lawmaking in AI security? Look, we, we always debate this among our partnership, and, and I really one of the things that I'm the most proud of in our firm is I have the best partners in the business. So people do come up with different opinions and, and we all have our own. Um, luckily, we don't have to be too involved in those aspects um, of government and regulation, right? We focus on our partners who are LPs, on buying great companies and improving the performance of those companies. Now, from time to time, buying these number one players and market leaders, we may get involved in things like should this be regulated or this new technology or this AI algorithm that you're producing. Our view currently is that AI and technology should not be regulated. Mm -hmm. That most people don't actually understand really how these systems work. You may get an explanation, but people, when you look at deep learning and the outputs, people don't, can't really figure out how that output was developed. Now, if you have a society that disagrees with the output or there are unintended consequences on that output, then deal with that and regulate the outcome of it. Mm -hmm. So we don't want this to be all gloom and doom when it comes to the security threats coming from AI. We no doubt have a lot of business leaders here who are going to go back to their offices tomorrow. Do you have some suggestions about what they should talk to their IT people, their security people about concerning AI? What kind of things should they be thinking about in terms of protecting their own infrastructure and their own companies? Can I market some of our companies? Can I sell some software? 
So, so look, um, when you look at cybersecurity vendors, and you're talking to your IT department, or in cases that you have big organizations, your chief security officers, make sure you're buying the number one. Don't, don't think about being cheap and buying the number three, four, five, six vendor in a given cyber protection area. Because the number one player, and most of these companies are machine learning, deep learning companies, get the advantage of all the data from all the customers. And they're able to develop more robust use cases. We have proof point in email cybersecurity, number one. Sale point in number one in data governance and identity. Ping identity in the number one in customer identity and workforce identity. And there are many other great areas. So buying the number one in cyber is really, really important. Overall, for all the leaders that are here, I would ask your IT department or your chief security officer three things. Number one, give me a list of all the digital assets that we have. It's, it's remarkable that in many cases, the CEO and the leader of the company is not asking that, right? If you're an investor, you know all your stocks. If you're in real estate, you know all your real estate assets. But what are, what's, what, what are the inventory of your digital assets? That's the first thing. The second thing is tell me where you think we are vulnerable. Give me the key areas of vulnerability. And the third thing is, what are you going to do about it? And overall, what we see, because we work with great chief security officers and IT, heads of IT, is that CISOs are very, very good, and they will know the answers to those questions, but they're very shy about getting budget from the CEO and the leaders of the company, especially when they hear that we need to cut costs and that this is the budget. So it's really, really important that the leaders just get involved, that they empower these people, and that they look at protecting this thing that they've invested so much money in. Three weeks ago, one of my partners was meeting with one of the biggest buyers of IT products, one of the biggest banks in the world. And they met with the head of IT and they met with the CISO. And they told them, for us, we have unlimited budget for cybersecurity because if we get an attack and a breach, we can bring down the whole financial system. Now, they are coordinated with the CEO and the board um, of the company. What would be, I mean, is there going to come a time where we're not going to have to worry about AI and cyber attacks? Or is this something that's going to be an ongoing evolution, that as the attackers and the, the threats come, that the cybersecurity industry is going to have to change and adapt to them, and that's never going to come to an end? It's, never, it's, it's just going to increase. Because the more assets that become digital, the more problems you're going to have. You know? And you're not going to eliminate bad actors in the world. Once again, we started in cyber with that simple theme. The world's going digital, companies are becoming software companies, now companies are becoming intelligent software companies, more of their businesses are going digital, more of their transactions, so there's more cyber threat, more cyber risk. But there's a second reason. It's become so difficult to identify who the good people are, who the good actors, and the bad actors. Once again, you can have a good actor that should not have access to certain data and certain information, and you have to protect that. You have to protect your business that way. You have to protect the person that way. And you have to even uh, uh, pass regulatory mandates. Any final thoughts that you would like to leave with the audience? Takeaways about AI and security? No, I, not that difficult to understand. There are a lot of buzzwords. Cyber, especially, is full of acronyms. They give you a new one every day to kind of keep the field to themselves, to keep it super complicated. Not difficult to understand. Engage in it understand it, and invest appropriately. And remember, if you're going to invest so much money in your company, in your digital assets, might as well really have them well set up with a good network, with good protection. Thank you. Orlando Bravo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, John.